Hi everyone, thank you for joining the second Reducer Juice um, webinar today on plastics. So as always, we'll kind of go through what we'll cover in today's webinar. We've got um, plastics is a massive topic that sort of covers a lot of um, different areas of sustainability. So we've got quite a bit to get through today. Um, and all, as always, I'll be looking to, to you guys to sort of get involved in answering some questions and sharing your experiences in your countries. So what we'll cover today is how do we get to the sort of plastic um, environmental issue at the moment? Um, some of the benefits of plastics, plastics and consumerism. Um, when did they become an issue then sort of running through the whole lifestyle perspective of plastics and then um, we'll get into sort of the classics. How can you uh, help in yourselves and how can you enact wider change and what are your institutions doing? So yeah, another feature that we've been sort of covering this year is um, we like to have a discussion point that we sort of raise at the beginning of the webinar and then we visit it again at the end of the webinar. So yeah, I'd love for you guys to sort of think about this question throughout the webinar and see if maybe you change your mind and it'd be great if we could have sort of group discussion at the end to cover this topic. So brief history of plastics. The original meaning was pliable and easy shaped. Um, that was before sort of plastics existed in the form that we know them today and now it refers to a synthetic or semi-synthetic polymer. Uh, the first plastic was made in 1907, that's the first fully synthetic plastic, Bakelite, and as you can see that's a sort of Bakelite radio on the right. Um, once the success of this uh, first material Bakelite which was used um, to insulate wires during the period of electrification in the US. It led to an explosion of chemical companies creating synthetic polymers um, of a large variety of weights, thicknesses, durabilities, and plastics for the first time offered a route to manufacturing that wasn't limited by nature, so it wasn't limited by um, natural resources. Some of the initial plastics that were widely used, so nylon, um, in sort of the World War II, uh, it was used for tights, parachutes and ropes. Um, ethylene is now the world's most abundant plastic. Um, Teflon, a brand of plastic which um, covers non-stick pans, but also covers NASA spacesuits and wind turbines. So those are some of the initial plastics that um, are abundant and most of them are still used heavily today. Uh, so the first question I'd like to ask the rest of you guys is what's the most abundant plastics in your country? So I'm not looking for sort of um, the exact number of yeah, nylon items, but if you would say uh, plastic bags, plastic bottles, because I know they can um, differ from country to country and it's not the same everywhere. Um, in the UK, I'd probably say it's plastic bottles um, that I'd see most often. So yeah, put those in the Q&A chat and you'll be um, sort of cover it in a bit. So the benefits of plastic, it always feels a bit strange to kind of go on about how great plastics are, but I feel like it's an important to know why they're so abundant and why they're used so often. Um, they're cheap to manufacture in comparison and to transport in comparison to some other heavier materials. Uh, they're versatile, as you can see from the picture. There's such a wide range of things that plastics can be used for. They're relatively light, so in comparison to to glass bottles, um, the transport of plastic bottles, they're so much lighter than um, glass. They're durable, um, which leads to them being an issue in terms of um, the environment, but they are very durable for the thickness that you manufacture them with. They're sanitary um, by nature in comparison to natural polymers, they are um, sterile and easy to manufacture into many forms. Again, some of the more benefits of plastic and why they've taken off is something important to note is that plastic wrapping has greatly improved the shelf life of food, leading to less food waste. So 
that's something to note when we're talking about um, removing single use plastics is would that affect um, the shelf life and lead to more food waste, which uh, in a few more weeks um, and later in the year we'll be talking about sustainable food. Um, plastics are extremely useful in medical industry. Like I said, they're sterile and they allow practitioners to um, have sterile, sterilized equipment quickly and easily. So things like surgical gloves, insulin pens, IV tubes and syringes, things that need to be sterile. Um, in hospitals, they've really improved the safety of um, medical equipment. And the introduction of plastics in transport and aviation has lowered the weight of vehicles, meaning they consume less for fuel and produce less emissions. So that's another thing to kind of note um, on the benefits of plastics. So how did we get to the point? Um, how do we transition from the materials that we used before to the amount of plastics used? And here on the right, we can see the sort of exponential growth of plastics. Um, yeah, in consumerism. So post World War Two, there was a boom in consumerism, um, especially to note that a lot of this is focused on the US. Um, after the US, they really wanted to encourage people to buy, buy, buy. Um, plastics replaced glass, paper and metal packaging, um, especially yeah, the sort of throwaways. And in the US prior to 1950, reusable packaging such as glass bottles had nearly a 96% return rate. And by the 1970s, the rate for all container returns had dropped below um, 5%. So you can sort of put that down to the boom in um, plastic uses and especially for like key throwaway things. So key offenders were polyethylene shopping bags, polystyrene food containers, you know, those shells that you would get a takeaway in and drinks bottles. And today, 500 billion plastic bottles are sold every year. So when did they start to become an issue? Um, when did they start to become an observed issue? It was around in the 1960s, people started to realize that um, plastics were turning up all over the ocean. And around this time, environmental awareness started to rise in American public consciousness around this time. Uh, I'd like to make that highlight because environmental awareness has been sort of, people have been aware about the environment in indigenous communities, um, since yeah since they've always been about but yeah in terms of the public in America around the 1960s and 70s um, and that translated to waste so people became aware of the issues that waste would um, impose on yeah the environment so in and around this time New York City proposed an imposed tax on plastic bottles and there was a motion in Hawaii to get single-use plastic bans and we'll sort of talk about how the how those um, taxes and the plastic ban went in the future. Um, plastic companies offered recycling as a solution, but yeah, we'll get on to sort of recycling as a solution to the plastic crisis later on in the webinar as well. So plastics are everywhere. It's important to note how abundant plastics are. So they're not just sort of single use plastics and wrappers and um, sort of the more common rubbish that you see. Um, our cars and planes are 50% plastics, like I mentioned earlier, some of the benefits of that. And our clothes are more often than not made out of polyester and nylon rather than cotton or wool. Um, and that's, yeah, again, important to note that the fibers that come off clothes um, pose an environmental risk as well. So, if you're in your room or in your university halls or wherever you're sort of sat, just have a look around you and put in the chat how many plastic items you can see within the first few minutes. For me, um, I expect the table that I'm sat at is made out of plastic and elements of my surface is made out of plastic. But yeah, it'd be great to sort of see the range of things that you can see um, around you made out of plastics. So how long do you think a plastic bottle takes to break down? So I'm really firing out the questions for you today, but um, yeah, if you could put in the chat how long you think it takes a plastic bottle to um, break down in, um, in sort of generally normal conditions. And Matt, has any of those um, come in? It'd be great to hear some of the responses. Um, yeah, we are running on our slight kind of 10 to 20 second delay. I've seen a couple of ones coming in, yeah, telling us what plastics they can see around them. So 
um, food packaging coming in. Yeah, I've also had quite a few interesting comments. Um, uh, people saying kind of what uh, are the main types of packaging where they're at. So I've been publishing all of them in the Q&A. So if you open those guys, you'll be able to see. But yeah, PET. So that's kind of your PET bottles and your plastic bottles, which I think you mentioned, Ryan. Poland, mm -hmm. someone say, um, Hannah's saying um, plastic bags and plastic bottles, are extremely popular. In Portugal, um, probably plastic packaging or bottles. So kind of, yeah, similar to, to Poland and what we're seeing as well. Um, then someone in the UK, um, Darcy, yeah, comes from a slightly different perspective as you, Ryan. So you're saying kind of thin plastic, the kind of packaging and wrapping, uh, which I know we've discussed in the past. Um, polythene products in India, mm -hmm. um, and then single-use plastics in Sri Lanka. So, and then yeah, Meg makes a really interesting point around, um, yeah, how plastic-heavy COVID tests are for that kind of sterilising point. Yeah, so, that's such a good point as well. Um... I know that was a big thing talked about over the COVID period was like plastic masks and um, yeah, if we're going into sort of focusing on things being sterilised then yeah, heavy on plastics. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we've now had a few, I haven't published them yet, but um, yeah, we've got a few um, answers coming in for your question up there. So Hannah's gone for D, which is 200 years. Um, Sidant um, has gone for 450 years. Amy T has gone for 450. Um, oh, Denise has said that they probably got um, around 10 plastic items around them right now. Um, yeah. We've got an anonymous person saying 450 years, um, Romani saying 450 years, another anonymous person 450 years, another Matt um, saying 450 years, that's not me, um, Denise 450, so yeah, the, the great general consensus, general consensus is, 450. is 450 years, so I'll uh, I'll disappear off and uh, yeah, let you go as the answer, right? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so um, again, the, it's, it's the beneficial properties of plastics that make them an environmental issue. Um, they're durable, they're abundant, um, lightweight and everything like that. So since the 50s, we've thrown away 6.3 billion tonnes of plastics. Um, like I said, they're incredibly abundant and durable with some plastics taking thousands of years to degrade into landfill. Uh, it's important to note some of these are sort of like the different conditions of um, landfill so if it's uh, exposed to more sun they break down quicker if it's um, wet they break down differently so um, these are sort of rough ideas of when so the people that said 450 years to decompose they were correct according to my research um, plastic drink strings take 400 years disposable nappies take 500 years and um, Matt made a really good point to me while I was researching this, that if you think about for every individual in this webinar, every nappy that's ever been worn by these people, um, every plastic toothbrush, every drinking straw and pen that we have have ever used is still on the planet in one form or another. So um, quite a scary thing to consider is, yeah, how, how much is built up in just our lifetimes of the people that have um, joined us on this webinar. Uh, important to note as well, when plastics degrade, they break down into microplastics. Again, this can be due to moisture, light, microbial action and heat. So the environmental um, impact of plastics isn't just um, when they're thrown away, which I think is one of the biggest focuses. Uh, plastics have an impact across their whole life cycle. So. Um, Resource extraction of plastics. Plastics, um, for those that don't know, are made out of fossil fuels. So um, crude oils and things like that are often used to make plastics. Um, currently, they use up 4% um, of the, the world's fossil fuels are used to make plastics. Uh, that's quite a small percentage at the moment. Um, between 2020 and 2040, uh, BP, so British Petroleum, expects plastics to represent 95% of the net growth in demand for oil. So as other industries decarbonise, plastics will still drive demand for fossil fuels. Um, production of plastics, so then there's the refining process of plastics. Um, plastic refining is one of the most intensive greenhouse gas intensive industries in the world. Um, it produces large amounts of emissions and requires large amounts of energy. So that's another thing to consider sort of the impact of plastics as well. And the end of life in plastics, generally when they get disposed of, um, they get in ways that they're supposed to be disposed of. There's incineration, landfill and recycling. And we're going to get into sort of landfill and recycling further on in the webinar. But um, incineration can produce energy. Um, 
which is yeah another form of electricity and everything like that but it also has a huge environmental impact in the us alone 5.9 million tons of co2 were produced from plastic incineration and another interesting point to um highlight that gets into sort of a climate and racial piece is in the us these facilities are built disproportionately near community communities of color um, that's not exclusive to the us but that's just where i found the research and across the world, it's the we less well-off communities that have to suffer the consequences of the pollutants um, these sort of incineration factories produce. And um, another thing to note, and it was mentioned by a student who took place, took part in um, Reduced Juice last year, is that in many countries, plastics are burned um, unmanaged just in the open. So this student mentioned that um, plastics were burned and started to create fires. Um, so people would just burn plastic bags to create fires. Obviously, there are loads of toxins um, associated with that. I think there's a Vice documentary as well about um, people in, I can't remember exactly where it is in Africa, but they were burning plastics as well and um, sort of the toxins that are associated with that as well. So yeah, when unmanaged and in the open, it can be very toxic for people burning plastics. So plastics in landfill, um, of the 6.3 billion tonnes of plastic produced, 12% has been incinerated, so this is ever, and 9% has been recycled. The remainder has ended up in landfill or the natural environment. So that gives you an idea of how much plastic there is out there and how such a small proportion that's actually ever been recycled. Um, of the three disposal methods uh, that we've previously mentioned, so incineration, landfill, and recycling, landfill has releases the lowest amount of emissions, but there are still environmental consequences and this should know that doesn't mean that it should be championed as a solution um, as the plastics break down in the sun if they do um, they release harmful chemicals into the soil and chemicals that leach into the water stream and cause damage that way and we get into sort of the damage that they can have on um, the natural environment as well so plastics in the sea um, yeah, we've all seen the pictures of huge amounts of plastics in the oceans choking fish animals and birds and um if this is a real picture on the right it's yeah upsetting to sort of see uh yeah natural creatures eating sort of plastics and everything like that uh, a common thought might be for i don't know somebody who lives in an urban environment is that you don't live near the sea and you would never dream of leaving your rubbish on the beach so you might not be responsible for this waste and plastics in the ocean it might be um you might assume it's sort of somebody else's uh, issue. Um, the large majority of consumer plastics in the ocean did not get discarded directly into the ocean or waterways. Most of it started off in a bin. Um, I make the distinction of consumer plastics because we'll get on to sort of ghost fishing and commercial fishing of plastics um, shortly in the webinar. Um, rivers, especially the largest, most polluted rivers. So I obviously live in London and yeah, we have a yeah, large river running through and I'm sure many of the people in this webinar if you live in a city will have a river running through. Um, it's the main mode of transport for plastics to end up in the sea. Between 1.1 and 2.4 million tons of plastics travel through um, the rivers and oceans to get into the sea. So roughly 8 million pieces of plastic find their way into the oceans every day. That sort of macro plastic so yeah, bigger than five millimeters. Um, 12 million tons of plastics are poured into the ocean every year. Um, and yeah, that kind of gives you an idea of yeah the real scale of the issue. Uh, this kills 100,000 marine mammals and um, 1 million seabirds are killed by this um, every year. And in the early 1990s, researchers noted that 60% to 80% of the waste in the oceans was non-biodegradable plastic and the amount of plastics washing up on beaches and in harbours was increasing. So as we go sort of further into the webinar, you'll notice that um, people have been aware of these issues for a long time. It's not just sort of um, in the mid 2000s where people were aware of the issues that plastics have had. Um, and we'll get on to maybe why it hasn't been addressed earlier and why I was still struggling to um, tackle this issue. But um, 
the World Economic Forum predicts that by 2050 we could have more plastics in the ocean than fish, which is yeah, really like a shocking stat for them to predict and put out there. So how big is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Um, I'll give you guys yeah, a bit of a delay to guess the size of the Great, Brit the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. We're just waiting for the answers to start filtering through around yeah, I'll start shouting them out as they come through. Um, Great. Yeah, I think seeing all those comparisons, one of a reminder just how large the oceans are. I saw something quite interesting on uh, Instagram the other day, which had every continent of the Earth, uh, every continent on, on Earth, um, fitting within the Pacific Ocean, just kind of a reminder of how oh, large yeah. oceans are. So yeah, it's, it's all those sorts of things. It's easy to forget about that. Ah, here we go. There's uh, ants coming through so I can stop waffling. Um, so Amy T has gone for D, which is twice the size of Texas. Um, Hannah has also gone for D. Davina has gone C, twice the size of France. We've got a couple of anonymous C's. Um, Sidant has gone for D as well. An anonymous going for the size of the UK and another person going for the size of the UK. So we see a bit of a consensus, I'd say, around D and C and a couple of A's. So yeah, mm -hmm. what have we got, Ryan? Oh, we've got more coming in, actually. Um, yeah, twice the size of Texas coming in as well. Yeah, so um, yeah, the people who vote D are correct. So I guess maybe sometimes I have to make some of these questions a bit harder. Easy. Some people already seem to know the stats. <laughs> um, yeah, we move on to the next slide, Matt. Ah, thanks. Um, so yeah, it's 1.6 million square kilometers around twice the size of Texas or just under three times the size of France. Um, it formed as a result of marine pollution gathering by the ocean currents. Um, and the effects of this patch are severe. As discussed, large patch Last, uh, sorry, large plastics cause the death of marine mammals and fish. Uh, one really sad thing I kind of um, came across was that albatrosses confuse little plastic resin pellets for fish eggs and directly feed them to their babies. So um, it's quite sad that idea. Um, also, due to plastics blocking out sunlight, algae is not growing as it should, and this affects the whole food chain. Um, if you think about an area that size. Uh, a disturbance in the amount of algae that is, um, yeah, that is underneath there, you, it's really sort of um, worrying to think of the knock-on effects of that across the whole ocean. And um, I, again, as always, we don't have time to go into sort of all of the, um, yeah, consequences of plastics and everything, but I'd encourage listeners to look up sort of bioaccumulation of plastics. Um, which is meaning that the plastics are sort of travelling up the food chain, especially microplastics. And um, if anybody has any questions, uh, shoot them into the chat and me and Matt will do hopefully our best to answer any questions about, yeah, if you want to, or mention any facts yourself about bioaccumulation of plastics. Like um, I've uh, yeah, tried to highlight, please, if you have any comments that you want to make throughout this that you think um, would be interesting to the rest of the group, please feel free to just put them in the chat or yeah, we always want to hear your thoughts um, on the webinar topics. So um, yeah, I made the distinction earlier about uh, consumer plastics in the last slide because the majority of the last large plastic pollution in the ocean is from fishing gear. Um, up to 70% of macroplastics floating on the surface of the ocean is fishing related. So if you think about that, um, I know some people have watched Seaspiracy and they really get into and highlight to me the sort of issues with um, yeah, fishing and ghost fishing equipment. So this can mean like nets, ropes, plastic crates, baskets, especially um, it's such like a difficult area to regulate um, people just chucking that into the oceans. It's especially dangerous to marine, marine life because by nature they're made to trap um, mammals, even smaller fish, everything like that. And it's estimated that 30% um, of the decline in some fish 
populations is a result of discarded fishing equipment. So microplastics, um, I'm sure everyone's kind of heard these words. Uh, yeah, microplastics, just because plastics don't biodegrade, they just break down into smaller and smaller pieces over time. Um, plastics with a diameter of less than five millimeters are classified as microplastics and they're extremely abundant and have been found in the Arctic ice and deep in the oceans, um, sort of strange places all over the world. Um, microplastics have been found and if anyone has any interesting stats on yeah where they've been found yeah put them in the chat as well so the accumulation of plastics in organisms um, can affect their ability to feed grow and reproduce so this is on land and like i said um sort of the effects of landfill um and in the sea as well so they've yeah done research on accumulation of microplastics causing um, yeah, their ability to reproduce, which um, has yeah terrible knock on effect further on yeah, in the future. Um, plastics in worms can reduce their fertility by 50%. If you think about the worm populations under landfill, you can sort of imagine how across the world, how um, bad that is. And in the biodiversity episode, we'll sort of get into biodiversity in the soil and the importance of yeah good biodiversity in the soil, which is often overlooked. Um, humans are not exempt as microplastics have been discovered to be accumulating in our organs and recently they've been found in the placentas of unborn babies. Um, it's important to note that during my research about this, um, there was a lot of articles sort of stating the fact that it's unknown what the impact is on humans, but if I had to take a guess, it probably wouldn't be too positive. But um, yeah, I don't want to sort of put out uh, any fear that that's, yeah, that they know what the effects of that are yet. So recycling, um, whenever talking about waste, recycling is yeah always mentioned. Um, those familiar with sort of like living in the UK will have heard of reduce, reuse and recycle. Um, and if anyone across the world has a similar sort of, if their country has a similar slogan to encourage recycling, yeah, it'd be great to hear that as well. Um, or if it's similar to just reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, it refers to three ways you can minimize the impact on the environment caused by waste in that order as well. So you follow the, um, yeah, the route of firstly, reduce the amount of waste by reducing the amount of per you're purchasing, um, reusing what you've already purchased, and then as a last resort, recycling. Uh, it's important to note recycling is a method of mitigating the plastic issue and it won't be our route to solving it. Of the, yeah, as mentioned earlier, of the 6.3 billion tonnes, only 600 million tonnes have ever been recycled. So that's only 9%, which highlights some of the flaws in the um, system. Um, to sort of name and shame the UK, the plastic recycling rate is only 39%. So if you think about the amount of plastics that we produce in the UK, for only us to be recycling 39% of it, it's quite worrying. Um, and as we yeah, as we know, where does it end up if it's um, yeah not getting recycled? It ends up in natural environments or in landfills. So it's quite yeah again quite worrying. Um, the problem with recycling plastics is the emissions associated, so it's quite energy intensive and every time a plastic is recycled it has to be downcycled. Down so um, much of the plastics we produce are low grade plastics such as films and polystyrene and it's not profitable for them to be recycled so often they're not. So if you think about the amount of thin film plastic that covers your food, the amount of polystyrene that covers your takeaways, or all your orders, so like Amazon orders and everything like that. Um, the idea that none of that gets recycled is yeah, pretty disappointing. The exporting of plastic waste. So another issue, especially here in the UK, I apologize for this episode, maybe focusing um, so much on the UK and America, but that's where I could find the most information. Um, and yeah, we'd like to hear from anyone who knows about sort of plastics in there. Um, country as well. Um, but yeah, another he issue here in the UK is that the infrastructure um, hasn't been invested in enough to handle the amount of waste that is being recycled. Um, so large amounts of it are being exported. So as of 
February 2021, the UK um, exported two and a half swimming pools worth of plastic um, every day. Previously, yeah, China was the main destination for this plastic, but in 2017, they announced a ban on that. And currently, the UK now exports the majority of its waste to Turkey and Malaysia. So as you can see from these pictures, um, in many of cases, just tankards of um, plastic waste will turn up in Turkey and Malaysia without a strong system um, for the destination of that plastic waste. So it get, ends up just being illegally dumped or burnt. Um, and yeah, like I said, this image highlights the fact that these t um, shipping containers are turning up with no real plan to dispose of them um, when they get to um, these countries. And yeah, it's sort of a theme across sustainability and um, the environment that passing sometimes, yeah, the West often passes off um, some of its issues to uh, other countries around the world um, and sometimes double counts those as well. So which of these countries do you think has the highest recycling rates? Um, yeah, just feel free to put yeah, the name of the country in the Q&A. And yeah, I'll have a look to see if some of the places as well. Cool, while well, I wait on the lag there, we've had some interesting comments coming in. So um, Dan has joined us. Yeah, great to see you, Dan. Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, <laughs> mentioned that um, yeah, microplastics also wash off clothing into wastewater. Um, so yeah, kind of washing machine manufacturers apparently working on filters to reduce that those microplastics, making it kind of out of the wastewater uh, and in, into sewers. Um, but um, yeah, still not quite there yet. Um, and mm. yeah, Dan also points out that ironically, um, recycled fleece jackets are a big source of uh, microplastics. So again, I suppose it shows that kind of that that difficulty of kind of one solution, kind of yeah, many solutions kind of often offer up their own problems as well. So yeah, great to see that plastics being recycled into fleeces, but um, yeah, obviously shame to see that that contributing to um, microplastics um, escaping mm. out into waterways. Um, yeah, I know there's um in that regard there's some bags that you I'm not sure it fully um addresses the problem, but there's bags that you can um tie your clothes in when they're washing them to hopefully yeah catch some of the microplastics from yeah that issue specifically. Oh cool, thanks Ryan. Yeah, no, that's hopefully useful one for people on the webinar to um to know and yeah see if they can look into. Yeah, um, we've had a few answers coming in, so we've got two votes for Germany, one for Wales. Um, Denise saying Switzerland, Sidant saying Germany, um, Davina saying South Korea and another for Germany. So I think we've got a split across them all. Austria hasn't yet had a vote, um, but yeah, I'd say the majority there coming in for Germany by the looks of things. OK, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so we've gone to the answers. Uh, yeah, so the people that vote Germany were correct. Um, I see some people on the webinar have got um, everything correct so far. So um, yeah, maybe I need to make some of the questions a bit more tricky. Um, but yeah, it's important to note as well that these are the top five countries in the world in that order. Um, so even the best performing countries in the world are only maxing out just over 50% um, of recycling rates, which are definitely something to look into how they're getting those kind of stats, especially when you um, look at the UK's plastic recycling rate being 39%, but also, yeah, a long way to go um, to be getting higher than 50%, especially when um, recycling has often been put as a solution to the plastics crisis and sort of offered up when, yeah, it's important to note that they're only up around 50%. So um, placing the onus or blaming um, consumers for uh, the plastics issue. Um, yeah, whilst individuals have the responsibility to be conscious consumers, I would always um, yeah, advocate for that. And I don't think anyone um, is personally not responsible, but it's important to not let um, corporations off the hook. And to, in my opinion, I don't think we're gonna get out of this crisis just by um, everyone being um, recycling or everyone being sort of, um, as conscious a consumer as they can be, I think they're still like with the fishing. Um, none of us, I don't think, have purchased or been directly responsible for fishing equipment, but we buy, yeah, fish and everything like that. So um, I think it's important to hold the corporations accountable. Um, plastic manufacturing companies are keen supporters of recycling campaigns um, from 
the around the 70s and 80s um, they've been supporting of recycling campaigns um, as that offers them a route to continue creating plastics when you keep saying that like oh these plastics are just going to be recycled in the end but so we're just going to keep creating them um, because they'll be recycled um, coca-cola pepsico and nestle are responsible for 14 percent of the branded um, branded plastic pollution globally so if you think about the amount um, in terms of some of the stats earlier about the amount of tons that that is um, yeah really gives you an idea of how responsible these corporations are for yeah, plastics around the world. Um, the introduction of littering campaigns um, by packaging companies. So in the 70s in America, when the public started to become aware of the environmental impacts of plastics, there was a real traction to solve this problem. So as I mentioned earlier, New York were about to introduce a plastic bottle tax. So this is in the 70s. Um, but the Society for the Plastics Industry filed a lawsuit claiming unfair treatment and pro the proposed tax was struck down by the Supreme Court. Um, and then Hawaii wanted to introduce a plastic bottle ban again in the 70s. Um, this was also struck down to a similar lawsuit claiming that, um, yeah, that it was unfair treatment. So what followed was an alliance of oil and drinks and packaging companies to diffuse the anti-plastic public sen sentiment. And um, a lot of people have said that this has put back sort of the fight against plastics a long way over since the 70s and 80s. Um, again, yeah, introduction of littering campaigns. So these alliance of oil and drinks and packaging companies started campaigns to, again, in my opinion, put the onus on cost consumers for littering. So they funded non-profit non organizations that highlighted um, that consumers were the responsibility for rubbish. And again, like I think people are um, responsible for their rubbish uh, at the same time, I think the, plus the companies that create these um, products also have a responsibility to um, help these products find yeah, even be recycled or um, thrown away in a more responsible manager, manner. So it's interesting to note as well that Coca-Cola created the campaign, Packages Don't Litter, People Do. Um, in my opinion, it's quite scary that the, yeah, it came from Coca-Cola saying that it's fully on um, people, that it's not literally as black and white as saying packages don't litter, people do. Um, this will be familiar to people who've been following the activities of oil companies, um, and we'll cover sort of more of these kind of activities in the next webinar, which is um, on greenwashing. And there was an interesting podcast called, um, yeah, highlighted around COP26, um, the greenwashing conspiracy, where I kind of heard about this um, from plastic companies. So kind of, I feel like I've um, even for these webinars, I feel like this has been a bit doom and gloomy. So we'll kind of have a look at some cases where um, plastics have yeah, managed to sort of be banned or um, yeah, sort of some of the root out of this plastic issue. So Rwanda's banning of single use plastics, they banned, banned plastic bags in 2008. Uh, this was largely successful. Um, they now have plans to ban all single use plastic by 2021. Um, they'll ban the manufacture, importation, use and sale of all single use plastics. Aside from the implica implications across the globe, um, the environment minister um, blames plastics for clogging up drainage, impacting agriculture and leading to standing water building up, which in Africa is um, a key uh, source of malaria, which um, yeah, is one of the biggest killers of people around the world. Um, they're not alone in Africa. So as Africa actually leads the globe in this area in terms of um, the removal of single use plastics, as they don't have a strong plastic lobbying and they don't export much plastic. So there isn't a big plastic industry to maybe get in the way um, like there is in the West. Um, so for those of us that joined me on the last webinar, we talked about how great Norway was um, in terms of their hydro. Um, yeah, hydroelectricity and Norway crops up again um, in the recycling of plastic bottles. So despite the limitations of recycling, high recycling rates are desirable and Norway has reached a 97% recycling rate of plastic bottles. So they're not quite up there in terms of um, 
the top five recyclers in the world. Um, but in terms of recycling of plastic bottles, they are um, yeah, leading in this regard. They've achieved this with a well-functioning deposit system. So um, customers pay an increased fee on plastic bottles and that's returned when bottles are deposited. So um, you actually receive yeah, a healthy three euros for receiving um, returning plastic bottles. To definitely be in, yeah, that definitely be an incentive for me and um, yeah, people to be collecting plastic bottles. So yeah, I'm going to quickly talk about some of the um, possible solutions to the plastics issue and current solutions going forward. Um, biodegradable plastics have been around since the 80s. Uh, although their name is misleading as they do not biodegrade in conventional landfills or in the oceans. Um, yeah, it's important to note that you kind of need really specific um, conditions for these plastics to biodegrade. Um, they need 130 degree heat in industrial composters and only a tiny proportion of very specific plastics will reach these sites. So um, when biodegradable plastics are mentioned as a solution, it's important to kind of note that they have their limitations. Um, chemical recycling. So the recycling um, is a potential solution. So instead of mechanical recycling, which breaks down the plastics um, and then reforms them, um, it's, yeah, plastic feedstock um, is the end result of chemical recycling. So it kind of contributes to a bit more of the circular economy. Um, and however, this is in the early stages and it's yet to be seen if this could be adopted on a wide scale, whether it be profitable for this to be um, a solution going forward. But it's something interesting to note that um, yeah, we could break them down into more of their um, earlier components. Um, there are also numerous non-profit organisations that are cleaning up the oceans, um, such as the Ocean Cleanup Project, um, and it's really encouraging to see that they've um, recently had yeah, their technology approved and they're going to start cleaning up the um, Great Pacific Garbage Patch um, and intercepting plastic waste in rivers. Um, mushrooms, another solution. So a type of mushroom secretes an enzyme that could degrade plastics um, to the point where they become food for the mushrooms and this could help break down plastics in landfill. But um, again, yeah, the wide scale adoption of this is, um, isn't yet to be seen. And if anyone has any other um, yeah, routes out of the plastic situation, please put them in the chat as well because yeah, they're quite interesting. So what can you do as an individual? Um, Look for single use plastics replacements. Um, so reusable coffee cups, metal straws. I know these have their own um, environmental impact, but if we're reducing the amount of single use plastics, that's the main goal. Um, reusable cutlery, reusable water bottles, so metal straws. Um, again, if you're looking for um, solutions to perhaps microfibers getting off your clothes, um, they're those bags that you can wash your clothes in. Uh, always avoid littering. Um, I feel like that's, yeah, you get taught that at a very young age, but I still know people that do it. Um, research the companies that you choose to shop at. What is their um, approach to waste? What are they doing? Do they offer schemes in terms of returning? So I know um, we have at my house uh, those reusable coffee pods and there are schemes where they can be returned or um, yeah, that as well. And making sure that you separate your waste correctly um, around university, in your own homes, putting batteries in the right place, that kind of thing um, definitely helps. So again, I feel like, um, yeah, the audience here will have some great little switches um, in the chat. So if you've got any, yeah, like helpful little switches where you've thought, um, I know some people across the universities even live like a zero waste lifestyle. So yeah, just put them in the chat and I'm sure everyone will be um, happy to hear them. And then hopefully I can take some of those and put them in the Facebook discussion group as well. So as always, it's not just about the individual. What can you do to enact a wider change? So contact your local representative in relation to the environment bills and policy. So if you know in your country that there um, there's currently an Environment Act um, happening in the UK and if you can um, contact your local representative to make sure that um, they're addressing plastics within this. Um, it's supporting organisations such as the Ocean Cleanup Project and there will be loads sort of local and global. Um, 
and where possible, you don't always have to um, support with your money. You can support with your time, um, offering to volunteer, um, going to events that they have, and they can be really fun opportunities to sort of meet people uh, who are like-minded as well. And share this information or other relevant information that you know. I know we've seen some great sort of inputs um, in the, yeah, inputs in the chat today share that information with your friends family members um yeah and that always helps in terms of getting people engaged with these issues uh, so what is your university doing so here at the university of london zero percent of waste goes to landfill um it's incinerated um or recycled we saved 1.9 tons of plastic which is one of my favorite stats is the size of a small giraffe um, and that's been removed from our catering operations. Um, that's for the last year. 64% um, of waste is recycled and students in halls, which we're looking to improve on the 64% waste, which um, yeah, from the help of students in halls and across our staff members as well. Um, students in halls, just quickly for anyone who's on, um, who lives in the University of London Hall, uh, we split it by food waste, raw and cooked food obviously goes in there. Um, last resort is packaging contaminated by food and um, other areas like that. And yeah, things that don't fit into the recycling category of cans, paper and plastic containers that have been cleaned before they go into um, our bins. Uh, the University of Surrey, so I'll leave this up um, for anyone as well who is watching this on demand, so you can kind of go through that, but um, their goal is to have all students and staff use reusable cups across the campus. Um, they've taken a pledge to replace all single-use plastics, um, cups with compostable cups, 100% vegetable de derived, apologies, that's harder than I thought it was going to say. Um, they established a 10p cup charge on single-use plastic cups, um, which has prevented over 100,000 single-use plastic cups from waste, which is yeah really encouraging. It always helps um, me feel motivated when you can see the um, results of your yeah policies and stuff like that. Um, and then to move on to reduce single-use plastics from catering outlets, they've introduced vegware, compostable cutlery plates and cups. They've introduced canned water options. Um, across some catering outlets to help eliminate single use plastics. Um, no plastic bags and introduce sustainable toiletry section in their university shop. So keep an eye out that for any University of Surrey students. Um, and eliminated plastics or in plastic bags from the university clubs. So University College London has the loop campaign, which um, for any of people interested in that, um, keep an eye out for it. And their aim is to become a single use plastic free campus by 2024. So upcoming projects will be 100% disposable free catering and hospitality for events. Um, major construction projects utilize a scorecard, which um, encourages the use of packaging, take back schemes and material reuse, which is um, an interesting to note that it's not just um, focused on, yeah, sort of students consumptions, but um, along, yeah, the construction, everything like that. And the review of lab suppliers to provide a list of recommended sustainable suppliers for consumables and take back schemes. So yeah, uh, Institute like UCL obviously has huge amounts of labs um, and there's yeah plastic waste associated with that as well. So onto the challenge. Um, thank you for everyone who submitted the um, challenge, the previous challenge. And yeah, I look forward to reading some of your submissions. Um, yeah, the winner will be chosen for that challenge on Friday. So if you put in your um, submission, just keep an eye on your emails and then the winner will receive the sort of prize worth £100 um, and then an invitation to be interviewed as well, if that's what you fancy. But obviously um, that's completely optional and only within your comfort. But yeah, um, enough of the sort of last challenge. What do you think the biggest problem is in your country and what would you want your leaders to do and why? So again, um, be creative. It doesn't have to be long. It can sort of be any length. Um, yeah, and longer isn't always better. But um, yeah, would an example be fast fashion, plastic bags, plastic bottles? Um, and yeah, uh, 
just to note as well, all the deadlines are before the next webinar. So the next webinar is taking place on the 25th um, of January. So we're taking a little break over Christmas. Um, and yeah, uh, that will be the deadline on the 24th. So I look forward to hearing um, yeah, some of your submissions and anyone who yeah completes this submission moves a step closer to getting the Advocate Award. And yeah, one of the things that people are into as well is the sustainable prizes. So um, the sustainable prizes will be you get four of these zero waste kits, um, which yeah hopefully covers a lot of areas for each person's house and um, everything like that, um, and each person's lifestyle. So they're yeah hopefully cut down on some of the plastic waste. You've got one for travel, one for bathrooms, um, kitchen, and a shopping bag kit. So yeah. Um, yeah, so the next webinar is on greenwashing. Um, it's a webinar I'm definitely excited to share with you guys in terms of con um, companies, countries and individuals saying one thing, um, politicians as well saying one thing and um, what kind of activities are they doing um, to support their claims of um, yeah, positive environmental action. We'll kind of get into a bit of the insidious side of um, how, yeah, like, topics that have been covered in this, how corporations have subverted positive environmental activity through lobbying and everything like that. Um, yeah, no, I think it'll be a really great webinar. So yeah, to revisit sort of, um, yeah, it'd be great to hear you guys' thoughts on single use plastics as a method of distracting us from wider climate issues, or are they an extremely important problem that needs to be addressed immediately by everyday people? So yeah, I think, yeah, it'd be just great to hear. Yeah, you guys have heard enough from my opinions and everything, but um, it'd be great to hear some of your thoughts and we can have a little chat and feel free to ask any sort of questions uh, around anything I mentioned in the webinar as well. But yeah, thank you for listening. Um, we guys that have stuck around till now. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ryan. I will leave that one up there. Um, and yeah, while we wait for people to catch up on the lag, I can run through some of the comments and, and suggestions we've had coming in through the Q and A, if you like. Um, so yeah, yeah throughout the question of um, yeah, what can we, what can people be doing to kind of other other ways of reducing their plastic consumption? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, one person suggested shopping from organic food school food stores. Um, so kind of a lot of food bought in tins. And kind of yeah, generally organic food stores are going to be a bit more, bit more careful around how they're packaging up their uh, their goods. Um, Darcy, um, yeah, made the suggestion of not supporting companies and industries that are huge contributors um, of plastics, um, which yeah, they they think is a really good place to start. So yeah, their suggestions were um, not eating fish, as obviously you discussed um, in detail the kind of the ghost fishing fishing issues, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, touched nicely on um, sea spiracy that certainly advocates the yeah moving away from um, eating seafoods. Um, for, well, plastics was only one of the issues they covered. Um, and yeah, Darcy also suggests boycotting um, the likes of Coca-Cola. And yeah, obviously kind of with your the information you gave everyone on um, yeah, just how many kind of plastic items are branded with Coca-Cola. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's maybe a good place to start. Um, Davine has also shared something really interesting um, um, from their country, uh, which is Kenya. Um, and yeah, they, they say that kind of one of the best ways to mitigate plastics is through innovation. And have said that yeah, in Kenya, not only um, do they have the world's strictest uh, plastic bag ban, um, but they're also home to the first sailing boat made 100% out of recycled plastic waste, which is really cool. And yeah, to top it off, um, they say that the seven ton boat is called Flip Floppy, which I quite like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no, that's brilliant. I think, um, yeah, no, really kind of maybe kind of you could develop something from that Davina for your, um, your challenge submission if you're going to put one in. Um, yeah, that'd be great to hear. Yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, kind of, there's definitely kind of, you can see kind of the beginnings of some good challenge entries coming in in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, and speaking of which, I think Meg Raid made a really good point. So obviously, um, thanks to Dan's comment, we had a little chat earlier on around um, the recycled fleeces releasing microplastics and kind of that kind of trade off of, yeah, you'd think you're doing something positive in um, getting yourself a nice recycled fleece, but um, when you can look at it in the round, maybe it's not quite as positive as you'd first hoped. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Meg draws our attention to, um, yeah, what's referred to as the rebound effect, um, which is kind of where um, kind of one thing you do um, may actually have a, a kind of one saving you make, I suppose, and one environmental benefit may have um, a negative impact. Mm -hmm. So, they 
yeah, give us some really nice examples. Um, oh yeah, well, they suggest first off that it's really important when looking at kind of policies and solutions. So links nicely to this type, this challenge. Um, and yeah, the examples they give are kind of looking at buying an electric car. Um, so obviously people kind of reduce their emissions because they're using an electric car instead of fossil fuels. Um, but it may mean that because they know they're reducing their emissions, um, they'll actually drive more. So instead of reducing their emissions in total, they instead go up, but kind of more indirectly. Um, they've also said that um, kind of another potential rebound effect there can be from electric cars is that because you'll be saving money on fuel by using electric um, instead of petrol, mm -hmm. you, um, you'll obviously be saving money, but you may end up kind of saving that money up, buying yourself a nice holiday, which in total results in more emissions. So um, yeah, no, really interesting. Yeah, thank you for drawing everyone's attention to the rebound effect there, Make It'd be interesting to see if people can um, maybe consider that in some of their challenge um, submissions, kind of what rebound effects there could be from the policies you're suggesting um and how they could be overcome um and then we have had a couple of questions in as well let me just dig those ones out yeah so question coming in from came in from shannon um part way through um asking if there are any popular alternatives to plastics um for instance do we have alternatives to plastic containers for liquid detergents such as shampoo bottles i don't know if you have any thoughts on that one ryan um yeah so as soon as it's kind of been mentioned, I realised that there are some great um, zero waste shops um, and sort of um, environmental shops, environmentally conscious shops um, where, yeah, switching maybe to like bars. So or you can get your shampoo and detergent in, um, yeah, in reusable um, containers like squidgy bottles that you can yeah take. Um, to the shop and then take it back, which is yeah reducing sort of the plastic waste associated with that. But I know that's a huge thing in my house. They're just the amount you get through, especially um, individuals getting through those. Yeah, is difficult and an easy way to save sort of single use plastics. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, no, I think it's yeah, definitely kind of interesting thought of those kind of alternatives there. I think again, it's kind of with a lot of the alternatives, there's they're kind of often come with their own issues. So I know, Ryan, you drew everyone's attention to um, kind of the difficulties around um, some of the recyclable plastics. So mm -hmm. I know one thing that kind of a lot of UK universities took up was um, what there is called vegware. So that's kind of um, recyclable um, food plates and those sorts of things which are single use but um, could go in food waste. Um, but unfortunately, because of the way food waste is managed in the UK, they all ended up kind of either going to landfill or being incinerated. So perhaps weren't kind of the immediate solution that many people thought of. So I think, yeah, there are those popular alternatives um, and kind of, yeah, with shampoos and those sorts of things, you've got, you can have your shampoo bars, kind of a bit like soap bars, but instead for shampoo. So kind of, yeah, think about those sorts of things. But I think with all these things, as ever with sustainability, is thinking about it in the round to see kind of what potential other impacts there may be. We've also had a few really interesting responses to the question you've posed up on the screen there as well, Ryan. So I might run through a couple of those ones. Mm -hmm. um, so Matt came and said, yeah, that plastic is often seen as contributing directly to climate change. Um, in general, people think that um, recycling will reduce climate change, whereas in reality, they're two different issues. So yeah, I think that, yeah, that is a really interesting one. And obviously, as Ryan said, um, recycling itself uses uses a lot of energy and thus creates emissions. So yeah, they're kind of there, there are kind of interconnections, but yeah, certainly are two different issues um, and, and kind of should be considered considered as such. Yeah, I really like that um, that response, Matt. Um, and yeah, I like the idea that you, sometimes they all get, especially in like sort of news and stuff, they all get kind of bundled into one mm. area where it's like you think that um, yeah, climate change is a bit of a different issue to like the plastic issue and um it, important to note that they're connected in um ways but also not to just like paint them with the same brush yeah no absolutely i completely agree i think it's yeah cap catching it in the right way isn't it and yeah i think the the um the news and many kind of outlets that we get information from uh yeah really bad for kind of conflating the two issues i suppose um, Romney also came in and said um, that they yeah, believe uh, that it is a distraction technique to a degree and so yeah, the majority of um, when you understand that the majority of plastic waste is from big industries such as fashion and fishing which you touched on mm -hmm. um, they believe that it's for scientists and engineers to develop better and more efficient recycling method methods rather than blaming consumers mm -hmm. um, especially when the sustainable options are usually more expensive um, so yeah I think that is a really interesting one I think it's some kind of 
I think it's really positive to see how kind of environmental movement is moving forward. Um, I know certainly kind of, yeah, when I was younger and starting to get involved in kind of the world of sustainability, there was so much focus on what can we do as individuals. But then you realise that actually, if, even if we were to all make a change in our own lives, um, that would only be a small part compared to kind of making for getting those cha big changes to come from big organisations and also kind of that, that wealthy 1% up there, <laughs> yeah. um, kind of, uh, kind of, yeah, huge consumers. Um, um, yeah, and I just noticed as well that I've um, yeah messaged a few as well asking if I can share your opinions on the um, Facebook discussion group so that anyone who's maybe missed it, um, we can have a discussion sort of outside the webinar as well. And um, yeah, if Matt, could you put on the um, social media slide next, please? Yeah, absolutely. I'll pop that one up. Yeah, so anyone who wants to sort of continue this conversation, I'm not drawing it to a close now, but there's the um, link for where the discussion group is. Yeah, it is so we can share some of our thoughts. Um, yeah, with some people who missed it today. Yeah, no, that would be brilliant to see people come up there. It was kind of, it was that, that was in response to feedback from last year's um, sessions um, and reduced the Juice Connect program. Um, yeah, quite a lot of members um, said that they were really keen to kind of have a discussion outside of the webinars and kind of interact more directly with one another. I think yeah. um, we're really lucky that it's such a, a global um, group of people joining us on these webinars and who've become part of Reduce the Juice Connect. Kind of just running over some of the answers earlier. Kind of Poland sticks out. Um, India kind of uh, have people from Kenya. You know what I mean? really truly global cohort of people just joining us today i think that there's so much kind of opportunity to really learn from each other and kind of share with each other um yeah in a definitely. way that kind of we don't always get when we're kind of siloed into our own countries so um yeah it'd be great for kind of those of you who've it's been great to see so many people really getting involved in the chat today i've only been able to kind of shout out a certain amount of these bits um but um yeah it'd be really great to kind of continue the discussion over there on the uh, facebook group as ryan said so one other questions just put, yeah, we've had a few other people responding to that that um question ryan posed but yeah i'll, I'll let that one continue on facebook i suppose mm -hmm. um we've had another question come in um someone's asked them yeah if we've got any thoughts about plastic from 3d printing um which is kind of yeah an interesting i suppose new technological development have you got any initial thoughts on that one ryan oh yeah that's something i haven't really considered to be honest um in terms of yeah the the areas from 3D printing. Um, yeah, I, just, I guess it depends on what materials are going to be used going forward in terms of how um, we're going to transition away from plastics, even if there is, from my research, it doesn't feel like there's a huge, um, a huge push to transition away from plastics in sort of like common industries and everything. So it's a bit worrying to think that if there's the appetite not there, I think people would still focus heavily on um, recycling and everything like that and while yeah biodegradable plastics are still mentioned um, like I said they're not um, they're not as biodegradable as the name would suggest but um yeah that's a really interesting point about sort of 3d printing um yeah I haven't considered that before um did the person asking have an opinion from be good to hear yeah why they brought that up or why they consider it to be a big yeah. issue going forward yeah, there's nothing in the Q&A, but yeah, if they wanted to come back, pop it in and we can read it out. But yeah, I suppose to me as well, it also, I, yeah, I completely agree, Ryan, in terms of kind of, yeah, what's being used. But I suppose it's also to me kind of what is the use of that 3D printing. Mm -hmm. So I know there are kind of some things that are being 3D printed, especially kind of in terms of um, kind of uh, the medical industry and kind of um, and kind of that, that scientific community, I think is fantastic. And I think if they can kind of really develop in terms of kind of surgical equipment or those sorts of elements, then absolutely fantastic. But then I know there's also kind of, as they've become on the mass market, uh, a propensity to just print things, 3D print things just for the fun of 3D printing things, mm. um, as ever with kind of any kind of new exciting technology. So I suppose on that latter example, yeah, on that, I would say my thoughts would be that um, 3D printing plastic 3d printing in that vein uh, is yeah maybe not so positive but yeah to me it would really depend um to a large degree upon what's being done with those plastic printed um objects yeah that's yeah that's such a good point i think it depends on the industry like if if it's going to be the medical industry i think that yeah they'll definitely be still heavily on plastics and probably not like half synthetic plastics fully synthetic plastics um but yeah, maybe other industries where yeah, using 3D printing um yeah will be sort of more sustainable materials. So like I know um the construction industry is looking into it as well and things like that. So 
depends on the industry i think is a really good point yeah no definitely excellent okay then well i think we've slightly overrun already but yeah no thank you for me for everyone who's got involved in the chat we've been have been doing our best to respond to you as we go along uh, and publishing kind of a number of those um questions but yeah there's certainly more going on so yeah continue the chat in the facebook group um and yeah i'll sign off for now and, and let you say goodbye to everyone uh yeah and thank you so much for listening yeah to me again guys um yeah and i'd love to sort of interact with yeah, you on facebook and again if this um is of interest to any of your friends as well uh it goes up on youtube um and for those of people that have submitted um for the first challenge yeah send us um keep an eye on your emails because i'll be announcing the winner for that on friday